I'm going to speak words. Artistic words. <laughs> now, I'm going to do three poems for you. If you've never been to a poetry slam before, one thing you need to know is that poetry slam poems typically are about three minutes each. So for me to do three of them in 10 minutes is going to be a little tricky, but I think I can do it, especially if I shut up talking about it and actually start a poem right now. It's the stupid people you got to worry about. Everybody thinks it's the evil people, but the reality is there's never that many evil people in the world at any one time. But the stupid people? The stupid people breed like cockroaches. And I know that comparison is offensive and insulting to cockroaches, but I'm trying to make a point here, which is simply that the world's stock of stupidity is being constantly replenished. Actually, it's always on the increase. Do you know that every day on this planet, half a million children are born? That means that according to my estimates, every week, every seven days, the world's gene pool sees the addition of over a million cute, adorable, precious, innocent-looking little morons. And all of these stupid births are more than enough to offset the stupid deaths that happen during the same time period. Okay, okay, you're thinking, but so what? Who cares? The stupid people aren't dangerous like the evil people. Oh, but they are. You see, the stupid people are the instrument, the blunt instrument, the evil people use to achieve their evil goals. I mean, do you think the Holocaust happened because of Adolf Hitler? Because of one guy? The Holocaust happened because in Germany in the 1930s, there were a bunch of strudel-eating dumbasses who listened to that art school dropout and then said to themselves, yeah, yeah, they are the devil incarnate. What the devil incarnate means? I'm so stupid, I don't even speak with a halfway decent German accent. Okay, okay, you're thinking. We get it, you're right, but what can we do about it? How do we stop the stupid? Well, at the risk of sounding a little stupid myself, I don't know. The problem as I see it is twofold. One, there is a strong genetic component to intelligence, and two, it is just as easy for stupid people to have sex as it is for smart people. And I don't know how to wrangle either one of that dilemma. I mean, is there some way that we could tweak the genetic material of an embryo to make it more intelligent? I guess someday we might have that capability. Alternately, is there some way we could make it more intellectually challenging to have sex? I mean, how would we do that? Institute some sort of massive redesign of undergarments so that you have to be able to explain the difference between Platonism and Aristotelianism to get a broad come off? Actually, that's not bad. But even if I could get the funding for that project, I mean, that's years away. That's strictly drawing board stuff. And in the meantime, the world just keeps getting stupider and stupider and stupider, and the stupidity is leading our species to the brink of destruction, and there's nothing we can do about it. Yes, of course, it's so obvious. This is going to sound crazy, but hear me out. Our only hope is for the smart people to start having as much sex as humanly possible. That way, we can radically increase the number of intelligent births per capita, and maybe, just maybe, we can stem the tide. Now, I know you have questions, the sort of questions intelligent people would have. Questions like, what if children don't figure into my plans? What about the risk of STDs from all this unprotected sex? How can I afford to raise a child in this economic environment? These are all really good questions, and I only have one answer, which is that since I started speaking, over 300 idiots have been born. Think about it. Thank you. Um, I see what I do as satire, which to me means um, I write poems which are funny, or at least try to be funny, but I also have a serious point behind them. Um, although I do have some poems which are funny just for the sake of being funny, and there is no serious point. And I have some poems which are not funny at all. So basically, my style is really, really consistent sometimes. But I want to, uh, thank you. Uh, I want to do a poem about injustice, because I like writing about injustice. Now, injustice takes many different forms. So let me ask you this. How many of you in the audience are left-handed? I feel your pain, because I am left-handed too. And this goes out to all the South Pauls in the audience. To be left-handed is to be misunderstanded, to be stranded and abandoned, and I just can't stand it anymore, so I'm here today to speak out against leftism, a problem so pervasive and insidious that it's embedded in our very language. Let me give you an example. She left me. It's not right. You see, left is a dagger in the shoulder blades, while right is continued cohabitation in a tropical paradise punctuated by lots of great sex, but that's just the beginning. R-I-G-H-T is, of course, a homophone for W-R-I-T-E, which means that as a poet, every time I sit down to write, I am haunted by the subtle echo of right. And I know that I'm starting out with one hand. You can guess which one tied behind my back. But really, that subtle echo is not very subtle at all. Have you ever noticed how many great rhymes there are for right? Well, I don't want to keep you here all night, 
So just limiting myself to the one syllable rhymes. There's bite, light, fight, fight, height, light, might, night, white, sight, trite, tight, white, and zeit. I know, I know. You can only do zeit if you were hyphenating it and the next line began with geist. That actually happened to me last week. Anyway, where does that leave me? Well, I'm left with not much. Bereft, you could say, the victim of theft. And I know who the culprits are. I've got them dead to rights. But I also know that might makes rights, so I'm not even going to bother with bothering. But that reminds me, have you ever noticed how idiomatic language is stacked against me and my people? If you really want something, you give your right arm for it, proving not only that you're in your right mind, but that your heart's in the right place, which will start you out on the right foot, which will be on the right track if you play your cards right. And maybe it serves me uh, right for dwelling on it, but it really bothers me that the best I can hope for is to be left at the altar. No doubt because I have two left feet, or maybe being out of left field has something to do with it. So what's the point of this? Am I here to demand my right? No, not exactly. And you are in your right mind if you think you can pacify me with a left-handed desk. I spit on your left-handed desk. <laughs> the fact is, my people have been using right-handed desks for thousands of years, and we're doing all, we're doing great. And we don't <laughs> want to get along with you. We don't want to peacefully coexist. We want a left evolution. We want a left evolution. And one of these days, we'll have it. One of these days, we'll be reading you your last rights. But until then, I'll do what I can with paper and pen. And when you mockingly, whether you realize it or not, say to me, I hear you're a poet. Is that right? I'll say through clenched teeth, it's correct. <laughs> but it's definitely not right. Woo! Woo! How many of you are fans of Jersey Shore? How many of you hate Jersey Shore? Woo! Oh, good. <laughs> There were seven wonders of the ancient world. The only one which still exists is the Great Pyramid of Giza in Egypt. One of the other six was the Temple of Artemis in Ephesus. The man who originally compiled the list of the seven wonders said it was the greatest of them all. Now the reason you will not be able to take a tour of the Temple of Artemis the next time you go for vacation to Ephesus is that it was burned to the ground in 356 BC by a man who immediately confessed to the crime. So what motivated this guy? He didn't like temples, maybe he had a problem with Artemis, no. This man robbed the world of one of the great wonders of antiquity because he wanted people in Corpus Christi, Texas, on November 17, 2012, to know his name. He did it to become famous, to immortalize himself. What a moron. But this is where the story gets interesting. After this man was executed, hopefully in a really painful way, Ephesians actually passed a law which made it illegal for anybody to ever mention his name again. The penalty for violating this law? Death. Unable to prevent this clown from destroying their temple, they were for sure not going to let him achieve his ultimate goal of immortality. But I do have to give the arsonist credit for one thing. At least, in his own stupid way, he was being original. You see, back in those days, people typically tried to become famous by, you know, accomplishing something building the Great Pyramids, writing epic poetry, conquering the world, that kind of thing. Before 356 BC, it had never occurred to anybody to try to become famous by making a complete idiot out of themselves. Which brings me to Jersey Shore. <laughs> Every time I accidentally catch a glimpse of this abomination, I have the exact same thought. Where are the Ephesians when you really need them? <laughs> now, am I saying that after the first episode of Jersey Shore aired, they should have immediately executed the cast and crew and passed a law threatening death to anybody who ever caught up again? <laughs> well, I'm not not saying that. But that's <laughs> not even really my point. What I'm saying here is that it used to be shameful to make a fool out of yourself. Now, we encourage it. I mean, it's a respected career path. Whatever happened to building pyramids, writing epic poetry, conquer, well, you probably shouldn't conquer the world, so you might get hurt. But I can't help but feel that the Ephesians had the right attitude. If we're going to tolerate, even encourage, stupidity and mediocrity, don't we run the risk of living in a world where nobody will ever try to accomplish anything? Building temples must be incredibly complicated. I wouldn't know where to begin it, but anybody can light a match. And David upset Razzard. Thank you so much. Good job, they're making